point. Hi, Dr. Kuoba. All right, I can see we are here. Yes, we're here. Yes, I hope we are well. Uh, I think I want to try and share the slides. Sarah, you are there? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the car because <laughs> I need to charge my phone. <laughs> Yeah, it's no power still. It's okay. We'll we'll be fine. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I hope people okay. can see the slides. Yeah, I can see. Can see the slides, and I hope they yes. can see the last thing. Yes, you can see them advancing. Agreed. So, what what are I I'm wondering? Or oh, you in the car? You don't have even a laptop. <laughs> To just survive, you shall be fine. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, so, like we agreed, we'll just uh, buy a little time for people to join in. Of course, it being KP only members, I'm not sure we will be too many, especially because we didn't invite like other outsiders, unless you guys have invited other people. So do not be discouraged by the numbers because we have a, num a, a good number of people who join in should do well. So I think as long as I can share the slides, I think it should be well. Carol, Car 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 you'll be telling me, not Carol, Sarah, you'll be telling me next. Is that the assumption? Okay. Yes, yes, I, I'll do that. <laughs> okay. Oh, no problem. Maybe I should first stop share so that uh, we can start the meeting. So, Levi, I just wanted to confirm that uh, the, the people will just be chatting, yeah? They will Sorry? not be able to... The, 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 the other members, other than us, the panelists, we will yes, yes. We'll chat. We'll chat, isn't it? Yeah, they'll be able to chat and they can also maybe, uh, they, 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 there is also a Q&A for them. Yeah, so I think that that uh, is your work, Caroline, to say that, to remind okay. them, isn't it? Okay, to remind them to put their questions. So I think as you are introducing the speakers, I'll just share, I'll just share the slides. Then now okay. pick up from them. So I think it should be well. Um, perhaps maybe I can get some background, just a refresher course. Dr. Sarah. Hi, Dr. Sarah. Hi, hi, girl. Hi. I just wanted to just get how you'd like me to introduce you. Okay. <laughs> if you don't bring members yet until, like, maybe give us two minutes before you bring the members. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know. What, what would you like to say? Just whatever Where you don't know. Just, I'm, I'm, currently at, 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 I'm currently at my track. So I'm fine. All right. Hmm. All right. I don't know whether Munga is here with us. Dr. Munga, he's here, but I can see his mic is off. 
No, he and it was yes. Hello. Hi. And I know lecturer at mm. Dequat. Yeah, just that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now the yes, attendees yes. are coming in, so let's uh, okay. be inside. Yeah. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I hope everyone is well. As we wait for other participants to join us, I would like to thank you who have already joined us this evening. And um, we hope that we are reminded that this is a Kenya Psychiatric Association and continuous professional development meeting. And the hope is that uh, we will continue to have these meetings every second or third Thursday of the month. And um, they are CPD accredited. I see a lot of people struggle with the issue of CPDs at the end of the year, but we are from the CPD desk, we are hoping to continue ensuring that we have as many CPD meetings so that we don't have people looking for the points when it's already December. So I, I want to first apologize. I think the, there were a few times when we had um, a few hitches with the CPDs because of the publishing them. But that point is still valid. We have since published them. And if, in, if anyone has a problem with the CPD uh, points that they were sent, kindly reach out to the Kenya Psychiatric Association. The email that sent you the same point so that, so that we can clarify what could be the problem and see what to do about it. So we are hoping that we will, as the year goes along, we will remain engaged and remain interested so that we can ensure that um, we get educated, but we also get uh, to ensure that we have the points to make sure that our license are renewed. We also continue to encourage members to continue registering with the Kenya Psychiatric Association. We know that, that membership piece also is very helpful for the association so that um, there can be the little funds we need to ensure that we are running the organization. And other than that, we also want to say that we also look forward to hopefully planning an in-person conference in August if things go very well. And we're hoping that people can continue sharing ideas about how that should look like. So I, I, I propose that uh, we could begin so that we don't wait for too long and so that we finish the meeting on time. So I'd like to hand over to the moderator of the evening today, who is um, Caroline. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, I am Dr. Bundi. I thank you so much for being here and for joining us for this meeting. As she has uh, aptly said, our topic today is polypharmacy. And I'll just begin right off the bat by introducing our speakers. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Sarah Wawa, who is at Machakos level five. And uh, we also have a panelist who is Dr. Edgar Munga, and he's a lecturer at um, JQuart. So without further ado, I just want to invite um, the speakers to the speaker to begin with the presentation. Dr. Wawa. Okay, thanks, Caroline. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to ask you to excuse me. I will not um, be projecting my image because I'm having a bit of a technical hitch. We have a blackout, so I've had to join on my phone. But uh, we'll still try and just continue as much uh, as, as, as possible. Um, Dr. Koba, next slide, please. 
Okay. So um, why why do, would why did we pick this specific topic? So we just uh, thought that uh, as the clinicians, we need to understand what polypharmacy is. We need to understand um, when it's rational to 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 use multiple drugs and when it's not. And basically, it's supposed to be a conversation starter. So and uh, it's supposed to open up a discussion amongst us about uh, polypharmacy. So I am not lecturing today. I know there's some of my friends who already sent me threatening text saying, oh, since you're the one lecturing today, I'm, I'm going to have hard questions, but I might just throw it back at them because I'd like us to all just um, be able to talk and, and, and look at ourselves and see what are we doing? Uh, how can we uh, better use drugs in our practices? And also, I'd just like us to explore the good part of it, the bad part of it, the ugly part of it, and promote rational use of drugs at the end of this session. Okay, so I just wanted uh, to remind us what our goals of patient treatment should be at all times. So the first thing should be harm prevention. And um, I was thinking about this and, and I saw that harm prevention is not only prevention um, of harm of the patient by the patient or by the community. Sometimes it's uh, prevention of harm by the clinician, which is us. So sometimes uh, we might do things or uh, uh, give drugs to patients that end up harming them. So we need to be very careful and uh, cognizant of that. Then um, the other things that um, our goals of treatment usually are, are controlling disturbed behavior, suppressing symptoms, and trying as much as possible for somebody to return to their best level of functioning. Uh, as fast as possible. And as we go through this um, this talk, we'll see that uh, this three might be some of the reasons why we end up using more than one drugs um, to, to treat a patient. Uh, the other thing is uh, we also try to just develop a good therapeutic alliance between us and the patient. And um, this comes up when we're able to educate the patient about especially the side effects and we're able to talk to them about the drugs we're giving them and make sure that they're, they're as comfortable as possible. So we don't want to pump them in with a lot of unnecessary drugs and then now that brings in an issue of non-adherence. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is polypharmacy? It's defined as a um, use of six or more uh, enteral or parenteral drugs. So both the injections plus the oral drugs for a period of more than two weeks. That's the standard definition. However, when it comes to psychiatry, it's defined as the use of two or more drugs for the same period of time or more. Okay. Then there's also something called uh, prescription duplicity, which um, refers to the use of two or more antipsychotics without a clear indication of, of, of their use, okay? And then uh, when we talk about poly, uh, polypharmacy, apart from there being a, a, quali, a quantitative aspect of it, which is the number of drugs in general, we can also look at it in that if you're using, they might not have gotten to the threshold of it being polypharmacy quali, quantitatively, but if you're using the same drugs, um, drugs with the same mechanism of action to treat, um, which symptoms, one symptom, then you could be doing polypharmacy with maybe less drugs than you having gotten to that threshold we've talked about. Then uh, it's also important for us to remember that uh, most of the international prescription guidelines call for a reasoned and conciliatory use of drugs. So whenever you're using any drug, there has to be a reason, there has to be an indication why you're using the drug. So you should always be having that at the back of your mind even as you're prescribing. Next slide, please. Okay, so the types of polypharmacy that I um, came across, um, the same class, which means that this you're using drugs or with the same, same mechanism of action. So if you're using um, maybe SSRIs, you use more than one SSRI to treat depression. Um, so you're using, uh, what you're doing is same class polypharmacy. Then there's multi-class polypharmacy where you use a full therapeutic dose of uh, one more than one medication of different classes to treat the same symptom cluster. But then adjunct adjunctive polypharmacy is when you use one drug to treat the adverse effects of a, a different class of drugs that you had already used on the patient. Then um, augmentation polypharmacy means that you're using a lower than normal dose of a drug and another drug that might be in a different class 
And the other drug that you're using is in a full therapeutic dose, but you're targeting the same symptoms. So for instance, if you have a patient with psychosis who is on risperidone, which um, is a second generation antipsychotic, uh, you end up giving them a low dose of haloperidol because of they had partial response to the risperidone. The other thing is um, about augmentation is could be um, you're adding a medication that for, for the same symptom cluster. So you, in, when you use maybe an antidepressant, then you add on uh, thyroxine or lithium, then you're augmenting. Then total polypharmacy just uh, refers to the total number of drugs that you're using, all, all of them together. Next slide, please. So a bit of background information. Um, um, as I was preparing, I went through uh, many different studies just to see how, how um, common is this and what are some of the things that I could pick out from the studies that have been done on polypharmacy. And um, I found that 10 to 40% of hospitalized patients usually are, are uh, using drugs that qualify to, to be um, classified as polypharmacy. And in the outpatient uh, settings, a third of the patients are using more than three psychotropic drugs. Um, people who have uh, practicing in, um, in, in an outpatient setting, I think will agree with this because um, where I practice, I see a lot of this. Most of the patients are on three drugs plus. Uh, the inc then uh, the incidence of polypharmacy from studies has been shown to be between 30 and 13 and 90%. Uh, there's a study from Nigeria that reported it being as high as 70.4%, and South Africa and Ethiopia reported about 28%. I couldn't find a study in Kenya, so I don't know if that means that we have not done any studies, or maybe I just did not read wide enough. But if we haven't done any studies, then this is a challenge for us to, to take up um, and, and do research on this. Then... Um, the mean number of drugs per hospitalization. So this is not just for, uh, this is not just psychiatry drugs was uh, 7.8, but psychiatry drugs was 4.07 per patient. Okay. Then 81.4% uh, of the patients who are on six drugs or more were five times more likely to have adverse effects of these drugs. And 14.2% uh, of uh, patients who were, were on two or more antipsychotics were more likely to have were two times more likely to have extra pyramidal side effects. Next slide. Okay, so now each drug that was being added to the patient was uh, increasing the hospital stay by 6.5, six days. I, I found this to be curious or interesting because I know sometimes we, we add on drugs because we are trying to make this patient get better as fast as possible. But it's interesting to note that studies are showing that the more drugs this patient is on, the more this patient is actually going to end up staying in hospital. So uh, polypharmacy was more common in males than females and in uh, people aged 25 to 45 years old. Now, um, uh, this was also something I just picked and I, found, I thought I should share that 19% of children were also found to be on two or more drugs. And uh, I have an experience with this. I Two weeks ago, I, I mean, is it two or one week ago during um, a, a, a child uh, psychiatry clinic, I, I saw a, a 13 year old who was I think on six drugs and uh, it was not really clear what the, what was being treated. So we had to figure out what was being treated and how to taper down and, and withdraw some of those drugs. And then the commonest drugs that the children usually are on are on ADHD drugs, an antipsychotic, a mood stabilizer and a sedative hypnotic. So it would be interesting um, to just hear from the rest of you if this, these are the kinds of things that you're seeing in your place of work. So which brings us to the question, is polypharmacy good or bad? Um, you can answer that wherever it is that you are, if you think that it's good or bad. Um, it's a very complex, it's, it's, it's a very complex uh, phenomena. It's debatable. Everybody has has their opinions. There are people who think that polypharmacy is all bad, the people who think it's all good, the people who are in the middle. But it's a very controversial and contentious um, kind of thing. Um, so when we were thinking of this topic, I remember Dr. Koba calls me and she said, I, I would be interested to hear what 
um, what is uh, is being said about polypharmacy because um, I have seen a lot of um, prescriptions from from colleagues that land at, land, land at my desk and I see a lot of drugs being used that I cannot understand. And she asked me, have you seen the same? And I said, yes. And then she she said, um, she asked me, do you sometimes think that maybe it's you who, who, who doesn't know what you're doing or maybe you forgot what you were taught in medical school or maybe you were taught the wrong thing. And uh, so we thought it would be interesting for us to all just um, listen in and, and just have a discussion about this. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, over the past two decades, polypharmacy was uh, really something that was shunned against. So um, the studies done then uh, were giving the same, same kinds of results that there was unproven efficacy, which was expensive, and was just bringing in more, more adverse effects. But um, as time has gone by, people have kind of come to, to accept it and especially when it comes to augmentation and uh, it, it has been shown to be superior to, to using um, just one drug in, in total symptom reduction of uh, patients with uh, psychiatric illnesses. Next slide, please. Okay, so then that brings us to the question of why would uh, you find yourself using more than one drug. And uh, the reasons have been very varied. So we'll just talk about them. I've put them in some in, in clusters so that we see how different things might make you have to use more than one drug. So if you have a patient with a comorbid illness, it might not be only um, a patient with uh, two different distinct psychiatric illnesses. It could be a non-psychiatric illness. You might end up finding yourself having to use um, more than uh, two drugs for the psychiatric illnesses or more than six drugs if you're adding in plus the medical illness. So in disease, uh, diseases that are refractory, uh, you might end up finding yourself adding a drug just to try and uh, um, uh, bring this patient, um, to, 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 uh, to just bring this patient back to, to um, a normal functioning and to try and uh, reduce the sim symptoms. Then the presentation of an illness. Um, for example, if you have um, a patient with depression who has uh, psychotic symptoms, maybe insomnia, you might find yourself giving an antidepressant, uh, giving something for the insomnia, and then uh, giving something for the psychotic symptoms. So you end up um, fulfilling the criteria of polypharmacy during that, um, that when, when you're dealing with that patient. Then patients who have a suboptimal response to treatment, you might end up having to add uh, another drug just to optimize the treatment. Then if you've missed a diagnosis or you've made a misdiagnosis and uh, your treatment is not helping the patient, then you might find yourself adding more and more drugs, just trying to, to, to get this patient to, to um, I mean, to try and treat this patient. And of course this might not work because you're targeting the wrong, um, the, uh, the, the wrong uh, receptors and the wrong um, neurotransmitters. So sometimes you might find yourself using uh, uh, an another drug just to manage the adverse effects of the drug that you have already given. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the other things would be patient factors. So a patient who's non-compliant um, to the medication, uh, most of the times our patients come in with a relative and uh, when we are taking the history, we end up listening to what the relative is saying. So if this patient is not taking the medication already and uh, the relatives come back and say, this patient is not sleeping at night, they are walking all over the place, you might be tempted to add, to, to add on something without knowing that the real reason is non-compliance. There are patients with uh, different personalities. There are those who just um, who will end up... Um, who, who want um, more attention and they think the more they say that they're not getting better, the more attention they get. So you might end up, you might end up uh, making up symptoms and uh, always they do, they're not, they're not um, improving and you just end up adding and adding more drugs to that. Uh, also, we have consumer choices. We know these days that our patients are well read. So sometimes a patient will come to you and will tell you, um, I read that I should use this and this and this, and you might find yourself pressured to just um, give them what they're asking for. Uh, and also the illness behavior just ties with what I had said before about the personality. 
Next slide, please. Okay. Now, this this was uh, where I found it to be interesting because this is what um, this is what uh, involves us, the clinicians. So, a lot of things were brought about as to why uh, we would be using more than one drug in treatment, and uh, some of the things that came up was uh, the the clinician viewing drugs as a primary solution to all problems. So each time the patient comes back and gives you a new problem, you just want to see hmm, what drug can I use to 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 target that specific symptom. So you just keep adding on on drugs. The other thing would be having a symptom based prescription. So if you have a patient um, with a depression and anxiety and uh, insomnia as one of the symptoms of depression, instead of you, uh, the clinician, uh, thinking of what drug can maybe cover all that, they end up giving a drug for each of the symptoms and they end up uh, using more than one drug. So the other thing would be fear of patient dissatisfaction. So you don't want the patient to go out there and say, uh, this, this uh, psychiatrist doesn't know what they're doing. So each time they come and uh, they're, not, they, they're not better, you might not have even waited for uh, a reasonable amount of time and you just add on a, a different drug so that at least the patient uh, is satisfied at that point. Uh, the other interesting thing was that some, some clinicians have this self images the all powerful healers so they just keep adding more and more drugs um, because of that uh, so there are others who um, adopt late or early to to treatment so and in, instead of um, if it's early you don't wait for a long enough time and you don't give a, an a optimal dose a therapeutic dose before you decide to add on another drug uh, the other thing that came up was poor ethics slash greed. They kind of come um, hand in hand where you have this um, kickbacks from these big farmers and uh, so that you can uh, get all these trips and uh, all the other things that they usually, the nice things they usually give us. So you keep pushing for their drugs because each time they come, they're like, how much have you sold and all that? Or maybe uh, you might have your own pharmacy and you need to sell. So sometimes that can also be a thing that is making you using use more more drugs than is necessary. Uh, another thing would be just following fads. Maybe you've recently come into a place and uh, you notice that um, everybody who's there is uh, if they have insomnia, we are adding amitriptyline or we are adding a low dose, I don't know, quetiapine. And uh, even though there is really no indication anywhere for those drugs to be used in that way, you use them because that's what's happening in the place that. Uh, that's what you found everyone else doing. And that ties to poor knowledge. If you don't know about um, what, what, what the guidelines are, what drugs are acceptable, then you might not be able to make the correct choices. The other thing is uh, prejudice and stigma. This is mostly for, for clinicians that do not work directly in mental, mental um, health. So like general practitioners, uh, I've seen this a lot in, um, in, 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 uh, in my place of practice, whenever there's a patient with a, a, a mental illness who might be in another ward, uh, instead of them starting with one drug and then optimizing it, you'll often find the patient on a cocktail of drugs because they say things like, mgonjwa mechemka, tunataka apunguze your steam haraka. So they put in as many drugs as they can think of. Okay, next slide. Okay. Then there's uh, the issue of the market-based system where the, the consumers who are now uh, our patients now have choice. Uh, they have read, so they make more demands and they have higher expectations. And this might end up uh, pushing you to have um, to, to use more, more drugs than is necessary. Then there are pressures from outside. We've already talked about the big farmers. For some, um, it might be your place of work uh, your your boss is telling you you need to sell or you need to get to this this uh, amount of um, of of um, you have to spend this amount per patient. And you've seen that especially with patients who have uh, insurances, so you might be be tempted to 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 just give more drugs than you need to give. Then uh, the other thing is just uh, how our systems are a bit frag fragmented. So we're not really working in an inter interdisciplinary um, kind of um, way. So the patient might, might be going somewhere for their 
their mental illness somewhere else for their hypertension, somewhere else for their diabetes. And uh, if there's something I have learned in this short practice of mine about patients is that when they go somewhere else, they never talk about what they got in the other place. So you, if, you, if you don't have that kind of system that links everybody together, you might end up using many more drugs and maybe you don't even know what is happening. Next slide, please. Okay. So I, I think we've gotten the gist that polypharmacy is not all bad. So there are times that it's okay to use them. Uh, it's been shown to give better symptom relief and better management of, of refractory diseases. Then if you have comorbid uh, conditions, you have to use that number of drugs. Um, it's also useful when you have to manage the adverse effect of a drug that you're using with another drug. Uh, the other thing that uh, it's good for is when uh, you need acute relief of symptoms while you're waiting for the delayed um, effect of another drug. For instance, if you have a patient who has, you've started on an antidepressant and maybe needs uh, something to help with the sleep, you can give a, a short acting sedative hypnotic as you wait for that time. So also to augment primary treatment. And uh, sometimes you might have to use uh, polypharmacy temporarily, especially when you find yourself having overlapping drugs. When you're switching from one drug to another, you might find yourself with two drugs or three drugs at, at one point, okay? Then it's also been argued that polypharmacy may reduce drug, drug dosage, which then if you're using more than two, I mean, two drugs or more of, you might have to use them at a lower dose, which then might help with the reduction of dose-dependent adverse effects. Next slide. Okay. So the problem with polypharmacy, especially when it's not used, um, when it's, it's not rational, is that the more drugs you have, of course, the more drug interactions you, 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 you get. And uh, the harder it is to, to just keep track of what is causing what interaction where. And then there might be a potentiation of adverse effects or it might be different adverse effects from the different drugs together. Of course, then it comes with the issue of adherence. The more drugs that somebody is taking, the less likely they are to adhere to, to, to taking those drugs. Uh, there's a cost implication, which is um, obvious. More, more drugs you're taking, the more expensive it, it is to the patient. Um, it's, it's been shown to increase uh, the number of hospitalizations and the number of hospital stays. And um, it may lead to either an overdose or an underdose of the, the many drugs that we're using. Next slide, please. Okay. And then uh, the thing with polypharmacy is it, 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 you end up having a complicated drug regimen. So you have to be really careful about um, what, is hap uh, what, what is happening to the patient. I mean, the, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics. It also promotes off-label usage of drugs. This is what you talked about, the FADs. You go somewhere and you find people are using this for this and it's not been indicated anywhere. Uh, it also would confound the effects of a drug. So it'd be so difficult for you to know what drug um, is the one that caused this therapeutic um, um, change in the patient or the clinical change in the patient. And it's also very difficult for you to assess the patient because you're not sure what, what worked. You're using multiple drugs at the same time. It's also been shown to increase mortality and morbidity. And um, there's that aspect of you as us as the clinicians making an educated guess vis-a-vis -vis using scientific evidence to treat the patient. Next slide, please. Okay, so Prescon and Lacey in 207 just came up with a, a sort of a check for when uh, it's okay to use polypharmacy. Okay, so if you have pathologically distinct comorbid illness, um, if uh, you're treating the adverse effects of a drug that you're using already, if you need to ameliorate an acute symptom of a of a of an illness as you're waiting for the delayed effect of the drug, the other drug that you've put the patient on. And when you're treating an intervening phase of a disease, for instance, if you have a patient with schizophrenia and they have a, um, post, uh, post psychosis or interpsychosis um, depression, then you can add in a, an antidepressant during that point in time. And then if you're boosting or augmenting the efficacy of a primary drug, it's also rational to use more, more than two drugs. Uh, so there were some sort of guiding principles that each time you have to use more than two, two or more drugs, just 
ask you can ask yourself this um have you tried uh have you tried a single agent have you tried it for the for for proper duration of time unacceptable duration of time and have you tried it at the optimal dose okay then you need to remember that sometimes it's necessary and it's useful to you to to use uh, two drugs or more when treating a psychiatric illness which um we've given the reasons already uh, the other thing to 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 put in mind is that even when you're using uh, multiple drugs it doesn't mean that you're hastening the therapeutic response okay and you may increase mortality and morbidity at the, the times when the combinations you're using are very expensive and they're really not not effective which uh, basically means that you're being wasteful uh, the other the the, the other principle is that uh, most of the times when you're using the benzodiazepine as adjuncts to a long-term therapy, it's unnecessary and you should avoid it as much as possible. Next slide, please. Okay, each time you have to use these drugs, always consider the different pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic interactions that you would expect from the drug. Then if you uh, have to use multiple drugs, you can try the research strategies first, the ones that have been shown to, to work before you, you try your own uh, cocktail of drugs. Um, if at all you're adding any more drugs and you feel like the other drug that you were using before was minimal, minimally effective or ineffective, then it's only prudent for you to withdraw that drug. And then uh, the other important thing is uh, that we should um, strive to use target objective target symptoms, structured rating skills to evaluate treatment. So um, it's very easy for somebody who, saw, who didn't see the patient on admission to see the patient now and say this patient is doing very badly. And it's possible that the patient has actually improved over time. They might not be at 100%, but they have. So um, in all our institutions, we should try and use like uh, the PANS and the HAMD just to, to evaluate this because um, they're more objective and all the other uh, structured rating skills that are available. Next slide, please. Okay. So then in just to do a sort of a recap now. Uh, so a good polypharmacy is polypharmacy that is rational and is beneficial to the patient. So bad polypharmacy is polypharmacy that pays no attention to the pharmacodynamic properties of the drugs. And most of the times it's just wasteful, it's ineffective. Then ugly polypharmacy now, this is what we really need to avoid. You don't pay any attention to the pharmacokinetic properties and the adverse effect of the drug. So potentially you're harming the patient, which means you're increasing mortality or morbidity. Next slide. Okay, so given, given the, the way we've talked about the good, the bad and uh, the ugly, I, I just thought it would be nice, um, Caroline and Edith, if we could just look through this and just see which, which categories, maybe a member of the audience could just tell us what they think, where they think this falls. Is that okay? I, I know that the members may not have this, the voice. Oh, really? Oh, can you, can you, maybe they can like raise it's your hand okay. and then you can unmute them. Uh, yeah, if they raise their hand or even they can put it in the chat, then I okay. can be able to read out their answers. Okay. So maybe you can give them like, I, I don't know, um, 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you guys uh, 20 seconds. You can just put that in the comment section or you can raise your hand. I think that's better so, to avoid them copying each other. And duplicate it. Yes, I hope you raise their hand. Uh, Levy can unmute them. Or are you saying you should unmute everyone now or make them part of the panel? I don't know. Let's let's only un unmute um the ones we select to answer the question. Okay, Levy, I hope you're there. Yes, I'm here. Okay. So I think or, 20 or, seconds or... are about to wrap up. Okay, or if nobody decides to answer, that's a problem with Zoom. Is like you can't see those, you can't see people <laughs> face to face. Um, Caroline and Edith, one of you will decide. <laughs> no, you are. Um, <laughs> I mean, all right. So basically, what you want us to do, just so that I can clarify, is to select one that's optimal. No, 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 not one, not not one that's optimal. Just look at this whole list. 
uh-huh. and tell me is it is it is it a is it a good are they good uh, polypharmacy combinations are they bad okay. or do you think that they are ugly from what we've just talked about all right all right so do we have a volunteer anyone you can raise your hand or you can even put it in the chat if not we will have to sacrifice ourselves <laughs> <laughs> And we're all learning, so it's fine even if it's wrong. <laughs> oh, or, or, or Dr. Munga, I, how did I forget you? Yeah, I think you can answer. One of you can just answer this, one of this, and then the other one answers because there are three more. We have to put them in the different categories. Okay. Um, for me, it looks a bit repetitive. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Madai, I can see your comment. She says, ugly, ugly, ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. And I think I also second her. I think it's very, very repetitive. Okay. So do you think it's do you think it's ugly or do you think it's bad? Because we said uh, ugly is is when it's potentially damaging to the patient, but bad is when bad is when you you don't um bad is when it's 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 uh it's ineffective. Okay. Fine. You say. You, you said ugly. Let's just go to the next slide. Okay. What about this one now? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I have a comment or two. Yes. Uh, uh, so uh i would uh like to say a few things the use of an ssri uh plus an snri for depression where there is treatment resistance is a well known um uh, augmentation strategy and therefore i wouldn't have a problem with that um because then, uh, you know, you are looking at a situation where you've, you've done your full, do, full expected uh, dosage of an SSRI. And therefore you're saying, let me, let me see what else I can do with this patient. So it's an acceptable practice uh, to, to uh, in fact, in total, let me make the general comment that uh, 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 the treatment augmentation using polypharmacy has been there for a long time, and we understand that to be a practice that uh, can actually benefit your patient. Uh, using aripiprazole and quetiapine for sleep, we know that uh, aripiprazole sometimes uh, actually causes insomnia, so I wouldn't uh, go for that. Quetiapine, again, is a well-known practice at lower dosages in terms mm-hmm. of um, helping with insomnia. Lithium and GABA for bipolar mood disorder. We must remember that lithium is a gold standard uh, for treating bipolar mood disorder. And usually we don't need to augment lithium with anything else. Um, so again, I'm not really for, for that. Citalopram and uh, paroxetine for depression, both are SSRIs. I don't think uh, we want to do two SSRIs in one patient. And therefore, I'll choose one or the other, depending on the circumstances. Donepizil and uh, oxybutynin. First of all, uh, we don't even know how to treat dementia. Um, I, 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 in my practice, uh, patients do come with uh, prescriptions of donepezil. I feel it's a waste of good money. We don't know how to treat dementia and therefore I don't even prescribe that. Oxybutynin is of course useful for incontinence. Thank you. Okay.
you're still there, Wawa. Is there something you yes, want to do next? Yeah, yes, I am. The next slide is also a combination. Um, is it is it okay? Do people think it's okay? Do people think it's bad? Thank you, Dr. Kigama, for just going through each of them. <laughs> No, Doctor Mother, it's not one patient on on, on all the drugs. It's just uh, each each um what is it? Each bullet is is for the different for maybe one patient and the next one is a different one. Okay, that, that makes a difference. I thought you all the drugs were to be administered to one patient. No, 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 no. Yeah. All right. So do you kind of want us to go? The systematically yes. the way Dr. Kikamo has? Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Right. Okay. Professor yeah, Madai yeah. also think the same thing that she misunderstood the question. Oh, you misunderstood. Them. Okay, okay. There's somebody speaking, I think. Yeah, yeah. hello. Uh, hi. Hi. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes, I have a power, but I might go off in a few minutes. But I just want to make a note on the on the kind of difference. Yeah. So um, for the citalopram and par paroxetine, as the doctor just said. Sorry, I'm I'm I'm, go I'm going off. Sorry, I have to mute. Unfortunately. Okay. Sorry, I think we've lost him. Anyway, we can go on to the next slide and continue the conversations. I, I can share this slide so that you just look at them later on and, and think, think through them. So next slide, Doc. The next one. Okay, all right, so then... Um, what can we do in our in our different practices just to make sure that um, we have uh, we are, we are practicing rational polypharmacy? So having sort of algorithms or developing protocols just to guide the people around on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So every every um, health facility should have this uh, at their disposal. Also, just uh, we should go around promoting rational drug use. Um, especially amongst uh, our colleagues who might not be practicing psychiatry or uh, junior colleagues. I know many hospitals are now having interns that are rotating in psychiatry. Then it's important to have periodic reviews, both at inpatient and at outpatient. Actually, this week, um, we have been privileged at, um, at, at Machakos Level 5 to, to get a clinical pharmacist who has subspecialized in psychiatry. So he'll be helping us do these periodic reviews. Um, the other thing about this is, uh, I, I can see that the periodic reviews can occur, should occur during outpatient visits. Unfortunately for most of, um, I think my experience anyway, when I was uh, training in Matari, is that there was a lot of clearing and uh, forwarding and you just see a lot of CT treatment, CT treatment without really looking and, and trying to figure out is this drug rational for this, uh, for this illness? Uh, is a combination rational? Then the other thing is uh, what I'd said before, using objective means to measure the treatment outcomes and um, the, the, the symptoms of a patient. Then uh, in places that can afford it, you could have a, a computerized system that will give you feedback and will flag off any any potential uh, harmful inter, um, combinations that that they can see. And uh, the other thing would be just having an interdisciplinary approach, making sure that everybody's on board. Uh, we have patients who have comorbid conditions that are not psychiatric, so the, the internal um, the internal physicians, if you, you have a, 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 ped, a pediatric patient, you might also bring in the pediatrician. Uh, if you have a pharmacist, you can also bring in the pharmacist. Uh, the other thing is it's important for pharmacies, pharmacists, rather pharmacists in a different pharmacy, even as they are dispensing the drugs, uh, we should, we should uh, develop a culture with them where they should be able to look through our prescriptions and if they see something that they feel is off, should be able to call you as a clinician and you can discuss and maybe explain why you're doing one, two, three, and just also they can give in their input instead of just prescribing, I mean, dispensing as 
uh, just blindly as prescribed without them putting in their input. Then it's important to educate the patient and, uh, and the, the caregivers on what you expect from uh, the treatment um, so that they don't have, um, they don't have um, expectations that are, are too high maybe. I don't know if that's the correct word to use, but they, they, they have proper expectations of how they, uh, the treatment should, uh, the, their treatment should, should go on. And, uh, and also they know if there are any adverse effects and they're able to report it back to you. And the other thing is we should be able to use a psycho rehabilitation programs as well. So use of the um, psychotherapy, if there are any social workers uh, that you have in your hospitals, just bring them on board so that it's not all about drugs. We also just look at the patient in a holistic manner. Next slide, please. Okay. And then there are some, uh, some protocols that, um, that have been, uh, that, uh, that I came across that just will just help you when you are prescribing two or more drugs, you need to ask yourself these things. First, try and keep the, the, the regimen as simple as possible. You should know the adverse effects of each of the drugs and only use a drug when you have a clear in, in indication and make sure that you're keeping a precise list of all the medications that are being used so that there are no medications that are being used that have not been documented at any one point, which unfortunately happens sometimes, especially in patient. Next slide. So to make sure that uh, when you're using uh, polypharmacy, um, you're being safe, so just allow time to address any medication issues before you either decide to add on more drugs. You need to understand every individual's variability. So the, the, the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetic uh, inter, um, differences that might be happening in the different people. Then you need to avoid potentially dangerous drug to drug interactions, um, which uh, you may, sometimes when you're using the drugs, you may not really, it, it may have slipped your mind that this drug is potentially um, very dangerous. This, um, these two drugs together are potentially dangerous. So I was actually made aware that there's, uh, there's an app that you can use. And uh, when you put in the different drugs that you want to use, if there's anything, it can it just quickly flag you off. Then also it's important to educate the patient on the adverse effect of each of the drugs. Next slide, please. Then um, also uh, there's a tridimensional approach that has been uh, fronted where you, you're taking care of these three things at the same time. So you take care of the anxiety and the mood symptoms. At the same time, make sure you're taking care of any cognitive abnormalities and make sure you're taking care of an in, any environmental factors, which means all of us are working together. The psychiatrist, the psychologist, if there are any social workers, uh, everybody is working together just, just to make sure the patient gets better as fast as possible. Next slide. Okay, so as we are winding up, I'd like us to ask ourselves a few questions and wherever you are. So is it wise for you to keep adding a new drug for every symptom? Or is it wise that for every symptom that fails to completely respond to a different drug, you have to add a new, a new drug? Um, so the other thing you should ask yourself, should you treat the symptom, should you treat the disorder, or should you treat the patient? We don't have to answer this. Maybe you can just think about it and answer it later on. So should you rely on uh, results from systematic reviews and meta-analysis, or should you rely on what your gut feelings or your clinical experience, or should you combine the two in your practice? And the other thing is, in a bid for quick relief, uh, are we becoming more pharmacopsychiatrists, and we're losing out on... Um, on the gains that can be brought about by incorporating psychotherapeutic psychiatry. Okay, so the take home message as uh, we're coming to an end is uh, that uh, polypharmacy is here with us. They, it's acceptable if you use it rationally. So you need to practice rational polypharmacy. It's important to just keep educating yourself uh, on the, the proper, um, the acceptable combinations, the proper clinical titrations, the use of uh, guidelines and protocols, even as you are picking the drugs that you want to use. Because whenever you have to do polypharmacy, remember those sail the tide and the tridimensional approaches. And the last thing I'd like to say is, um, I think there's a challenge on, the, on a need for researchers to take up 
uh, study on polypharmacy so that the next time we're able to, to know what is happening in our local context and can inform our decisions better. I think that was the last slide. Yeah, it's okay, the other one is fine, just it's fine. Thank you everyone, over back to you, Caroline. Wow, thank you so, so much for the awesome presentation. Um, it was very thorough. Um, personally, this is at the point where I'd like to just say thank you and to invite anybody who has either a comment or a question. So you can just put it in the comment section and then I can read it out. So anybody who has any comment or question. Yeah, but um, before they can answer the questions, I think we'd invite yeah. Dr. Munga to make his comments. All right, yes, Dr. Munga. Thank you, Dr. Avondi and Dr. Kuoba. And Dr. Wawa, that was quite a comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. I think there's not much I'll add, just some few, just some few things. First, I'd also like to thank Dr. Kigamwa for your input. I think this this the this is the direction maybe we should take here, yeah? sort of like justifying why we are we are prescribing uh, a drug if we can explain uh, the reason rather than as Dr. Wawa has put just using our gut feeling and just feel like this drug will work for the patient if we have a basis basically for uh, uh, for having different uh, medications for our patients so I think that's that's important. Another point maybe I'd like to add is that we've been actually prescribing uh, for our patients uh, on, on the basis of symptoms. And maybe some examples that I've, I've come across even in our, at our national uh, referral hospital, uh, that's Madare, is uh, you'll get a patient you're managing for, let's say a psychotic condition. You have them on a second generation and psychotic, and then maybe they have uh, some sleep issues. You'll add, yeah, you add a low dose uh, clopromazine uh, for that. Is there something maybe that could have uh, could have been better, or maybe topping up uh, the dose of the drug that the patient is currently on, or something just maybe to deal with that symptom for a short while rather than giving the patient another suboptimal dose of uh, of an antipsychotic. Another instance that I've come across is uh, a patient who is manic, still with sleep issues. We are giving them, because we, I think we've been programmed to think that amitriptyline just has that sedative effect. So it doesn't matter the, the cause of the, uh, of, of the sleep disturbance. We routinely uh, prescribe uh, amitriptyline and then we wonder why our patients are always in a manic uh, sort of like state. So I think this, we need to have sort of we need to be rational in our in, in, in our prescription, basically. Um, another thing maybe that I could add, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Wawa has uh, emphasized uh, this, let, let's be evidence-based. Uh, let, let's read widely, especially uh, uh, for, for the registrars. Uh, I've seen some some of the prescriptions that maybe I, I won't comment on, but I think we just need to uh, to to read widely. We have evidence on why we are prescribing this and uh, uh, not that. And I'm happy that this this should just be sort of like a conversation starter. It's not uh, an end to it all. It's, it it wasn't a lecture as such. So even from here, I think we should be we should be able now to review to look at our at our prescription habits and see where we can improve. Uh, just some few things maybe to also point out. And uh, I think uh, th th this is, uh, it's sort of like an ongoing thing uh, at Madara where we have more than one antipsychotic, maybe we have a depot, we have an oral. Uh, at times the patients feel they, like, they feel burdened uh, to be getting an injection and also continuing. Uh, it, it, are there studies maybe for that? that uh, does it show maybe improvement in the long run uh, to the patient? Or maybe could we taper down the oral medication when the steady state of the depot is reached? So these are things maybe we might also consider looking at. Uh, because 
you, you might wonder why our patients uh, keep uh, falling off from taking medication, but I think it's the issue of the, also the, uh, the pill burden due to the polypharmacy uh, causing some dysfunction, some uh, uh, what uh, metabolic uh, side effects uh, in case of the antipsychotics. So let, let's let's be. I think my take home will just be let's be evidence based. Let's let's look at uh, what's happening. Uh, the correct thing. Let's do the correct thing. Basically, let's not just rely on our gut feelings uh, in managing our patients. I, I think maybe that's all I'll add. Unless there are any questions or comments. Thank you. All right. I have a Thank comment. You. Can I comment? Yes, go ahead. You can go ahead. Can I make? I don't know what, uh, whether you can hear me well because I'm wearing we earphones. All oh, good. You. Just go ahead. Now, I, I just wanted to, to make a, a brief comment because one of the reasons why I thought that when you put up the slide was for one patient is because uh, today uh, our case presentation was a patient who was on six different antipsychotics at the same time and a mood stabilizer. I mean, I, I think that is the maximum, six different antipsychotics. And of course, uh, with poor uh, response. So, uh, I, uh, you know, when I saw that slide, that came back. So uh, um, one of the problems that uh, we, so it's a real problem that we have uh, in, in our prescription habits. And, and one of the, one of the problems that we have, let me talk about Mathare because I think the Mathare, Mathare has a serious uh, prescribing uh, habits because one of the things that uh, is happening, or so I'm told, is patients are put on drug depending on uh, uh, availability. Like uh, if, if the drug, if for example, uh, patients who are on insurance on any HIF uh, get a certain drugs like uh, olanzapine and uh, the others don't but if it looks as if the olanzapine in the pharmacy is about to expire that is quickly pushed or risperidone into the wards and those who are getting well, on hal haloperidol are now switched or added on and of course once they go home they don't have uh, capacity to buy it. So these are uh, uh, accessibility and availability, including the buying capacity must be taken into consideration. Doesn't make any sense uh, putting a patient on a, on, a, on a drug for two weeks because it's about to expire. You hammer them with it and then you discharge them and then they go off drugs. So we, we are really messing around with patients because of this. The other one is that the, the the idea that every patient has to be given everything just in case. And I think this has to do with poor knowledge and, and a poor, poor culture where uh, uh, just in case it could be schizoaffective. So why not hammer them with a mood stabilizer? Every patient in Madare is on a mood stabilizer and the mood stabilizer that they are on is uh, carbamazepine usually, which decreases the plasma concentration of most antipsychotics. So you give an antipsychotics and then you give a mood stabilizer so the, the plasma concentration is low. So of course, uh, patients don't uh, 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 do very well. So, I mean, we have to be realistic. Not every patient in Madare has bipolar mood disorder. And, uh, and so I, I think this, I just wanted to make this uh, a few comments. And then about studies, uh, there was a study which was done in 20, 15, and uh, we uh, one of our projects uh, sponsored this study, and this study was done by a pharmacist, and he looked at the prescribing habits of uh, uh, the doctors in Madare, and he, he even published a paper looking at the prevalence and severity of potential da potentially dangerous drug drug interactions in Madare, and I think it would an important one because it also looked at the number of uh, drugs that uh, patients were on. So it's kind of, it's 2015. I'm not saying you should not do another study. Of course, we, we need to do another study because even the number of drugs av accessible, available have increased, but I think it would be important also. I think somehow this study uh, never reached uh, the, the, the mental health profession 
but uh, I think it would be a useful study uh, to look at. And if you are interested, I could even look for the for the paper and send it around, and uh, maybe even look for the. I had even suggested to uh, Dr. Koba that I could look for this uh, person uh, to make a presentation, but I don't know whether I'll find him. But I can look for the paper, and I think it is a very useful paper. Thank you very much. Dr. Koba, maybe if I can say something just to echo what uh, Dr. Madai has, Prof. Madai has said, uh, especially on the issue of uh, using kabamazepine at Madari, I think it's it, it's it's a thing of following fads and clearing and forwarding where you don't want to change what 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 you found uh, maybe on the being done on on the on the files because you'll see very good notes actually pointing towards a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And then on the treatment sheet, you find carbamazepine and you wonder why, why, why it is there. So I, I think we just have to, I think it's an issue of knowledge and also I don't know whether it's confidence on the part of the, of the doctors in training. I think we just have to be, uh, to read widely so that you can have sort of like a basis on why you are, you are giving certain medication. Because also another drug that I've seen uh, being prescribed and maybe not in a very good way is sodium valproate where you'll find ladies in, a, in childbearing age are given that. And I think we've had several, uh, we've been given several, uh, uh, not, not warnings per se, on the, on, on the effect of uh, uh, sodium valproate. So I think we just have to try to follow at least what, what the guidelines say. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. If there's any other question or comment, you can put it in the chat box. Um, thank you, Dr. Mugira George. You say that it's a very helpful presentation. Uh, thank you for that. In case anybody else has a question, you can raise your hand, put a comment, or just go ahead and share your comment or question. I think, uh, first of all, I want to thank the Dr. Wawa and Dr. Munga and Dr. Madai and Dr. Kigamo for those contributions. And, and, and for me, one of the reasons why I was really interested in this topic is because what disappoints me sometimes is the new patients. And, and their patients, we have agreed, have not responded well and we need to augment. But I always feel a bit confused when you see maybe it's a first, it's a first time patient and they've been put on, say, Risperidone and Olanzapine at the same time. And um, sometimes you get confused about what the rationale is. And, and I like what Munga has said in Wawa at the same time that we need to be scientists who are evidence-based so that even if you woke up in the middle of the night, you can say why you did that. Because I think there's a call to, to make sure that when we practice, even, even the, the practice of psychiatry is respected. I know we all know that is that anti-psychiatric movement. And when we look like we're not practicing based on science, then in my own opinion, it also contributes to the, our own stigmatization. Like you don't know what you're doing, it's not science, it's something, especially when you're combining very many medications. I remember at one point when I came to my institution and I found so many patients on amitriptyline, carbamazepine, and uh, at that time it would be olanzapine. And, and then you wonder, so why are they on all that? And I've I've interacted with that twice here yeah, and when I also went to Kakamega and, and you can feel that, especially for some people who've practiced for a very long time, there's some reluctance. And, and I remember like when I went to Kakamega, there was a question, this girl who's just come from school, uh, why she, because I, I actually did CMEs to try and say, okay, let's, let's try to do it scientifically so that we, we can be scientists and recognize as such. But there was quite a challenge. So, I feel like it's very important that we be able to make sure that we are respected as a profession because what we are practicing in science and it can be challenged objectively. I think for me that, that's what was in my head when I was thinking about this. And I think Taro, if, I don't know whether there are any other questions or comments or it's at the top of the hour. If there are no questions or comments, what do you think? Wounded. 
yeah, sorry. So I'm saying, um, basically, I think the only comments are comments saying that it was an informative presentation. So I don't think there are any more questions. So we can uh, we can uh, wrap this up. Yeah, and as we wrap it up, apart from the CPD desk, is to thank everyone who was able to join us this evening. We are asking that we, we continue to join these meetings. I find it a challenge, especially when I joined the office, when um, people need CPD points and we don't know where to get them from. So I'm encouraging all of us, we promise as the CPD uh, committee that we will endeavor to have as many CPD meetings as possible to ensure that at the end of the year, you have your 50 points. And we, we are doing it differently this time so that I will be sharing with the, K, with the, the Secretariat of KPA and they will be sharing the, 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 the points. And I want at this point to also apologize again for those who may have received some other some points that were not activated, please, I believe we still have the email. The, 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 as I was learning, there was the publishing bit and I realized I needed to publish both the meeting and the CPD points. That has already been done. So if you have any issue, please send us an email and we will respond appropriately. So let's keep doing this. Support us by joining the meetings and engaging with us so that we learn together for the good of the people that we serve. We are also looking for people who can partner with us. Remember, that some of these, most of these meetings may not be funded, but again, KPA also needs some funds. So if you have a drug company that would like to do a meeting, we'd also like to do it through KPA, like support one of these meetings. So that uh, instead of like parallel meetings, so that, that we, they gain and we also gain as Kenya Psychiatric Association. So I'd like to thank everyone and we look forward to meeting you on the third, Thursday next month with a different topic and come learn with us. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Doc. Thank you for that. I'm yeah, seeing just, you. let me just read this fun, last final comment before we go. Miss from uh, Benson Gakenya, misuse of carbamazepine is a national problem. I see patients in several county hospitals and almost every patient is on it at a small dose of 200 milligrams. It's a tall order to change this practice because even when you change it, the treatment sheet retains it mysteriously. The challenge also is that we have psychiatrists who are not psychiatrists, so sad. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Prof, for that comment. I believe it, it's true, but I think, again, when we keep talking, when we keep conversing and keep saying the right thing and hopefully also publishing, because we say maybe we need to do more publications locally, people will begin to, to know that as you practice, it should be evidence-based. So, Professor Gakinya, thank you. And thank you, Sarah Rawa. Thank you, Munga, for accepting to join us and teaching us. And thank you, Caroline Wundi, also for moderating very well. We thank everyone and we wish, to wish everyone a great evening. Let's see you on the third Thursday of March, God willing. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye.